Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Silverstein. I'm the education reporter at the Times Union. Um, I'm here talking about some of the latest developments um, as schools are feverishly preparing to reopen. Of course, school officials have numerous challenges ahead of them um, in the final days given uh, due to the COVID-19 health crisis. Um, but simultaneously, there's another crisis unfolding. We're seeing a lot of unrest nationally and around the world after the killing of George Floyd um, and more awareness of some of the racism and institutional barriers that people of color face. Um, and there's two students that I just wanted to talk to today who have been really active in bringing the conversation to their high school. They are both in college now, but they're graduates of Shenandoah High School. Um, they have been marching at their just at the around at the school board of education um, these last few weeks um, to raise awareness for you know aggression that students of color and LGBT students in the high school face, um, and they have a list of demands that they've presented, and they are being really persistent, and they're here to talk to us a little bit about um, why you know racial justice should be. Uh, integral part of the conversation about reopening schools. We also have joining us Damaris Miller, who is an activist who is uh, really instrumental in Black Lives Matter movements in the capital region, who's going to provide a little bit more context um, and shed some light on some of the other activism that's going on in our area. Um, okay, so let's start with TJ. You received the most recent graduate of Shenandoah. Can you tell us a little bit about your activism at the high school and how you got involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so really um, this goes back all the way to my sophomore year uh, of high school um, in 2016. Um, you know, most Shen alumni and students can attest to the fact that it's not rare to see the Confederate flag on campus. Um, and you know, early in my sophomore year, that became a huge issue for myself, um, for other students of color, and for white students as well. Um, you know, kids would fly that flag on their trucks. Um, they would wear the flag on their clothing. And no one had a problem that people were displaying something that's considered a hate symbol by the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and, you know, that's something that affected me all the time. Uh, every morning going to school, I wasn't thinking about the work I had to do or basketball practice after school or seeing my friends. I was thinking about the kids I passed in the hall every day who would wear a Confederate flag hoodie and stare at me as if they were daring me to do something or retaliate. What, what um, would happen when you'd report those incidents to the administration? Well, yeah, so myself and two other students, uh, we took it upon ourselves to meet with administrators and propose, well, we started by proposing policy change um, to get a uh, flag explicitly banned uh, in the code of conduct. Um, and on one of the first meetings we had with administrators, they relayed a message onto us from their district lawyer where they referenced the Tinker versus Des Moines Supreme Court case. And they said that in order for something to be banned by the school, it must be considered a substantial disruption and that there simply were not enough black students at Shen for them to consider it disruptive. Um, and you know, that was, kind of shocking to me because, you know, it shouldn't matter if there's three black students or 3,000 3, black students, you should be defending your marginalized students who are feeling harassed by your other students who are displaying hate symbols. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, in 2011, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth District uh, in Cincinnati had ruled unanimous, unanimously in favor of a public school that barred students from wearing the Confederate flag. And one of those students actually tried to appeal that case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court denied it. They wouldn't take that case. So to me, that's just the precedent that, hey, schools, you have the power to ban this flag. Um, but you know- I love how, how deep your research went. You really yeah. looked at case law and had to combat hey, sort of- Hey, laws. yeah. I, I, like, I love to tell people we wouldn't be doing this if the facts didn't back it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but you know, I think so, some of the thing, issues you highlighted are beyond like harassment and bullying and yes. displaying the Confederate flag. You also mm -hmm. talked about sort of institutional barriers that students of color face at Shen. Can you talk about that? Like 
in terms of like access to courses? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, access to courses is a very uh, interesting topic um, because that was one of the things we had in our demands as well as opening all courses to all students um, regardless or regardless of anything. Um, but we were told that for some time now, Shen has always or Shen has always opened all their uh, classes to all their students. But you know, when I was in seventh grade, I wanted to take um, eighth grade honors math, and I was highly discouraged from my teacher for taking it. And she even she wouldn't recommend me. And my mom had email battles with her where she said I wasn't an honors type student. Um, and she didn't want to put me in the class. And, you know, eventually I feel like parents really know how to work their magic. And my mom got me into that class and I excelled, but, you know, Dr. Robinson claims that all these classes are open to everyone, but, you know, he's not in the school every day. So he doesn't see that teachers do discourage kids from, uh, taking these classes, you know, a court or Oh, yeah. Let's fast forward a bit. Um, Samira, can you tell us about how you and your brother decided to start sort of a, a mini movement at Shen and how, how you got kids involved? Yeah, well, um, I mean, after the killing of George Floyd, um, I feel like our generation, we saw Trayvon Martin die and we saw his killer walk away free and George Floyd, he was like our Emmett Till. Um, and I feel like with both those instances, with Emmett Till and George Floyd, it was, it was something that people who didn't notice before had to see. Um, so like now, like when me and TJ are out and doing these protests, I mean, we thought right away, like where can we, where can we be most effective? And we said grassroots, we start with our community, we start with Shenandoah, and we start with banning the Confederate flag. Um, I mean, like, it's simple, like, after all the traumas that uh, we have all been through uh, this summer, um, it's so important that students feel safe in their school, because I'll tell you right now, that these students who I talk to all the time and, and are in our group, they are, do not feel safe in school. They do not feel safe in Shenandoah. And the first step to doing that is explicitly banning hate symbols to show to their students, to show their marginalized students that they're really about the equity that they talk about. And so you and your brother came up with a list of demands and it's a very robust list of demands. You guys are like professional activists, seems like. <laughs> um, and it's very intersectional and you particularly focused on um, trans youth and LGBTQ youth. Um, is mm -hmm. that something that you've observed or you got a lot of feedback about from students there? Yeah, well, um, we actually have um, a specific uh, um, activist in our group. Her name is Jaziri. And she is a black trans woman and she um, really is the one that's helping us uh, with our um, intersectionality demands, especially um, including trans history and queer history and giving a safe space uh, for trans people. And that doesn't just mean like having a group and having a discussion one day of a year. It means uh, consistently checking on these students once a week and having meetings and making sure that they feel as if they are human and that they are treated the way everyone should be treated as white cis males. Um, and um, yeah, so she has really helped us out on that and yeah. So would you say, how many people would you say are part of your group? So um, TJ and I, we are actually organizers of all of us. Um, based in Schenectady, uh, where the co-founders are Jamaica Miles and Sean Young. Um, so we are the organ we are a part of all of us, and we're the um, flipped apart organizers, but we still have um, activists in our group from our first speak out on July 25th that continuously um, put in work and are doing, um, you know, extra stuff for us that uh, really helps. So I would say about like five to 16, including me and you. Mm. Yeah. Would you say 50, 60? Five to six, five to six. Five to, five to six, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so it's growing. It's, but you did get a lot of support, 2,000 oh, people yeah. your petition, um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interest around it. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to bring um, Damaris in 
I think, can you speak to some, the intersectionality of this? We're seeing like two crises, obviously there's the COVID health crises, and we're also seeing, you know, spurred by the death of George Floyd, um, recognition for the barriers that, you know, marginalized students face in school. Can you talk about how that's, how that um, fits together? Um, sure. Yeah. First, just want to thank TJ and Samira for sharing the work y'all doing is so important. And I feel like you just illustrated two ways that schools are completely embedded in institu institutional racism. I think of institutional racism as the system that prioritizes maintaining a, the status quo, the power dynamics of prioritizing white people, white owned property, um, people who conform to this uh, able-bodied, cisgender, heteronormative, uh, white, often male um, archetype are the people who are valued within our educational system, are the people that are valued within our, our entire society, really, from schools all the way to mm -hmm. criminal justice or injustice. Um, and so I'm really moved by TJ, um, starting with how harmful it is for black students to be going into a school where there's all these hate symbols all around and the school saying, well, actually the, the, that, that violence against those black students, there's not enough of them for it to, for it to matter enough for us to try to get these white students to not be spreading hate. Right. So like, mm -hmm. what is that saying to those students that your feelings don't matter as much as these white students ability to be spreading spreading messages of hate, right? Mm -hmm. And so like that being um, just a really um, like uh, illustrative way of how schools are designed to create workers and they're designed to teach white children, you know? And so anytime mm -hmm. that black children are not conforming to what is this perceived desired output of, of um, this standard of education, the standard of behavior, um, they're instantly criminalized for that action. And just in general, I think the way I, I'm pulling it into the COVID is like so many black children, trans children, queer children um, are not seeing themselves represented in the schools that they're going to, right? So whether it's the hate crimes or not being able to get into the, into the classes that they wanna take or the curriculum that they're coming, that they're learning in those classrooms, they're not seeing themselves. So why mm -hmm. would they, why should they care about what they're learning if they're not see, being able to like see themselves reflected in, in those narratives, in those messages? Mm -hmm. And I think COVID is really exacerbating that because now there's not even the impetus of going to school, of being with your friends, at least. Now it's all online, or for many students, it's online, um, which creates another, yet another barrier. And so if the, if the uh, administration isn't taking all these um, efforts to disrupt the institutional racism, the systemic racism, and make sure that the schools are reflecting the students, including the black students, the queer students, the trans students, um, then you're continuing to create a system that shuts those students out of learning. And of course, mm -hmm. we know there's like a, a huge achievement gap for students of color and other marginalized students, student, low income students. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we saw during the closures in March, um, we've written about this bit, um, the, that disparity has just deepened because, you know, disproportionately the kids that couldn't get online, the kids that couldn't log in and, and do have sort of this like lost learning are children of color. Um, and so they, I think that, you know, it's easy for administrators to brush it away and say we have more important existential health issues to deal with. But, uh, you know, equity clearly, can you talk about like why equity is such an important part of the conversation around um, safely opening schools? TJ, do you want to jump in? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, and you say like, they keep brushing this off. This has been something that they've been brushing off for decades. You know, like it's time that they make this a priority. Um, obviously, COVID is real. It's important, and so is institutional racism. Um, they like this has to be hand in hand. You can't favor one over the other. This like they have to both be priorities. Um, and for an administrator to say, "Hey, like I'm sorry that you're experiencing these uh, these hurdles and this." this uh, institutional racism, but you know, we have these other problems, so you're gonna have to wait. I mean, that, that really tells you a lot about what they really uh, have their priorities set on and what, they're, and what students they're worried about taking care of. Um, you know, and yeah, no, you can. 
Um, so I just wanted to briefly read a statement from the school district. Um, mm -hmm. They did respond to our inquiry about the complaints of students of bullying and, and you know, lack of opportunity. Um, so a spokeswoman for Shenandoah says the district administration and the Board of Education had the opportunity to hear directly from students and appreciate the perspectives they shared. Um, the significance of supporting social justice initiatives is a prominent component of planning efforts from reviewing curriculum offerings to planning for an eclectic array of professional development offerings and various activities to enhance student engagement and leverage the diverse strength of the school community. As the district focuses on executing school reopening efforts, equity and opportunities and outcomes is a predominant goal. Um, how does that compare to previous interactions you've had with school officials? Um, I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, because they, they tell us that they support our activism and that they're working to do the same uh, work. And they tell us that they heard us, but this isn't about hearing us. It's about inviting your students and your marginalized or in, inviting your students and your alumni into these conversations and putting them at the front of these conversations because they're the people make, are going through this. Um, you know, we were told by the superintendent, Dr. Robinson, that our question, our tactics were questionable. He told us that before we start spamming people's emails, we need to read and understand the record of Shen and that we and that social justice work isn't about being popular and trendy. Um, he told us that we can't have a crab in the bucket mentality. Um, so, you know, they tell us that they're supporting us and that they're working for equity and inclusion, but how are you gonna tell students who are trying to advocate for other students that they're being popular and trendy and then go and uh, say that you're doing all this work and uh, for, for, this, uh, for this cause? Um, you know, we even had, I had the athletic director reach out to me, someone who I haven't talked to since one of my last basketball games. And he told us that we were being hostile. He told us that we need to be more civil and that making demands were out of character for us. He told us that we need to listen to Dr. Robinson because he's always pushing the Shen teachers to do their best and do this work in equity and inclusion. Well, let me tell you, if have they his- responded, Sorry, have they responded to the specific demands that you've made in your petition, um, which has like really constructive ideas about how they can improve the curriculum. Um, can I read some of them for, so that people can get a sense? It's like mm -hmm. a very thoughtful document. Have they, like it says, you know, recommending that, you know, the barriers to access of AP classes, of course. Um, and then, you know, anti-racist trauma-informed curriculum and systems should, um, there needs to be um, diversify texts that are used to reflect contemporary stories that center black, brown, indigenous, and queer joy, because we need to be celebrated, not just shown as victims. Um, and that seems like, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, maybe like Damaris, do you wanna jump in about how, you know, con a constructive feedback for schools in terms of how they can actually improve their curriculum and make them more inclusive? Well, first, I guess I wanted to problematize the words equity and inclusion, um, because I think that they're often used to sweep these kinds of concerns away. Um, and even just like in, in the, the language itself, right? So like when we talk about equity and, and inclusion, what are we talking about? With inclusion, we're talking about including students in the school that they're already a part of, right? Including students in a curriculum that has already been established. Like why, why is it that they're only being included now, right? Why aren't they at the center of it? Like TJ and Samir's demands are saying, why aren't they um, helping to design it? Why aren't, why aren't there more narratives that are reflecting their own identities in the curriculum already? And for equity, I'm, I feel like that word is used a lot to be like, we wanna provide the same, the, same, um, the same education that we provide to white students, we wanna provide to these other students. But that to me um, feels like that's not equity at all because what, what, what I'm hearing TJ and Samir ask for is a, ref, is a curriculum and a school that reflects their identities, where they can actually see themselves in the curriculum, where they can trust that they're gonna go into school and they're not gonna to have to face um, explicitly racist messaging and bullying, right? And so to me, that's, that's not like, that's not an issue of equity, that's an issue, issue of justice. Mm. Samira, do you wanna jump in? How is, have, has the school addressed the specific demands in any way? Yeah, so actually we have um, a whole document of Dr. Robinson responding to 
every single demand and to every single demand he goes in and saying on how Shenandoah is already doing these things and why Shenandoah does not need to do anything else um I mean a lot of it like uh for example uh our activist Jaziri the black trans woman she talked about how it was very important that her rostering was correct um, and this is something I talked about at the board meeting as well, a board meeting that was close to the public. And the only reason my brother and I got to talk was because we showed up with 40 people. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so Jaziri talked about how she emailed Dr. Robinson countless times, countless times, just to get her name, her gender changed in the rostering. And when we sent that to Dr. Robinson, he responded saying how there's a new program called um what's it called t do you remember uh, it like the something like i don't know uh, name I, a pronounced, or something. A, a, some type of new program talking about pronounce pronouncing pronouncing someone's name and honestly like the fact that he responded that to that in that exact demand i found that just disrespectful because uh, we're not talking about pronunciation we're talking about we're talking about someone's identity we're talking yeah. about some, yeah, go ahead, too. I was going to say, and I feel like that, that really just tells you all you need to know. Like, he can't yeah. even read our, our demands thoroughly enough to give us adequate responses. Like, that's, we're not even talking about that. And how, how can you expect us to trust you that you're doing the work that we're asking you to do if you can't even respond in an adequate way? Um, well, you guys have been really persistent and you keep showing up. So hopefully um, you'll get your point across and get a seat at the table. Um, they haven't invited you to any of the panels or anything, have they? The reopening discussion? Uh, we continuously contact them asking for a meeting and we still haven't gotten anything yet. So. Wow. Um, all right. Well, I think this is a really important issue. Clearly, um, it's getting a lot of attention right now. And we're, it's not obviously not exclusive to Shen. We're seeing similar movements at colleges and high schools all over the country. People are starting Instagram accounts and highlighting people's personal stories and traumas that they experienced. Um, have you gotten feedback? Have you become sort of like the person students feel comfortable confiding in? Do you have to sort of listen? Are you the person who sort of absorbs a lot of the stories? Um, I mean, honestly, no, I, we've had, I've had a lot more people talk to me, but we're definitely not the people, um, I, like students still don't really feel all that comfortable putting themselves on the line and reliving their trauma all the time too. And a lot of people just don't like to talk about this stuff because it, it's very harmful for them. And I feel like that just shows you how dangerous this is like the time we are living in like this activism stuff clearly it's not we're not doing it for trend for trends and for clout because we're over here getting threatened you know i was i was just at daryl mount's vigil the other night and we had protesters how are you coming in and protesting a vigil we have motorcycles flipping us off people on trucks with their Trump flags going back and forth, back and forth. And it just, it, it just makes me think like, I don't understand how people don't think that Saratoga County is any different from Kenosha or Minneapolis. Like it's not just because, it's not just because um, someone gets shot, but I mean, someone did get shot seven years ago and nobody is talking about Daryl Mount. Nobody, nobody is talking about, nobody is talking about Edson, Edson Thevesen. Right? I said, yeah. Seven in. Yeah. Seven yeah, in. Well, yeah. Nobody is talking about that. And that happened in our backyard. Everybody wants to be trendy. Everybody wants to talk about Black Lives Matter, Black Trans Lives Matter. But where are you? What are you doing? I think that the response that you all have been getting from the superintendent and the school administration is very reflective of the response that we've been getting in Troy to our community organizing, where we've been organizing for years since the death of Edson Thevenin and the shooting mm -hmm. of Dominique McDonald. And ultimately, you know, had this rally in the beginning of June that brought 11,000 people to Troy, the biggest rally 
of like in living memory. Um, one of the largest turnouts that we can see in the entire country based on the size of Troy. So to have 11,000 people turn out to a 55,000 population city is massive. And the only thing that um, our city council has done is to pass a resolution saying Black Lives Matter, but not mentioning Edson Thevenin or Dominic McDonald, mentioning George Floyd. Again, like why are you talking about these people that are in other states when there are actual cases of Black people being killed or attempted um, are shot by Troy police and you're not even naming them. And then ultimately that resolution was just about, we're going to start these uh, listening circles that are going to ultimately make recommendations to the mayor without any type of commitment to actual change. And that's what we're really out here saying is like, it's talking is fine, but we've been sharing with you. We've been talking. Right. We actually know now what we want. We want to redesign these systems. We want to change, transform these systems. And when you come at us with just saying, oh, but let, we need to hear more. We need to hear from more people. We need to hear from more students. Um, it's again, it's further showing us that you are not invested in this process with us. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I really appreciate that, you know, Damaris, you're doing a lot of this activism on the ground, but, and, and I appreciate that, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter activists have not given up. They're still talking, they're trying to keep it in the spotlight because it's, it, like you said, a lot of these issues haven't been addressed. Um, but obviously, like, I think it's, you know, Samir, can you talk about, like, a lot of this starts at a very young age, like inequity and discrimination and, you know, bias starts, you know, can you talk about like the earliest time you feel like you were made aware of your race and that you were different or didn't have the same opportunities? Cool. Yeah, so um, actually I was in, a, this isn't my first memory, but it's probably the one that stings the most. Uh, I was in third grade and I went to Niskayuna uh, at Craig Elementary and I was on the bus. And this was right after uh, President Obama was elected and I was wearing an Obama girl shirt. And um, I was on the back of the bus and I had three boys in my class put their hood up, point it and tell them, tell me that the KKK is coming to get me tonight. Um, I got off the bus and I told the bus driver, I told my parents, and the next day I talked to the principal with them in there. And I only found out recently, my mom told me that the principal said to my mom that I brought it onto myself because I was wearing an Obama girl's shirt. Wow. Is this um, something that you feel like teens experience a lot? Like when they try to report these incidents or to administrations, they're kind of accused of starting it or, or blamed for it. 100%. Um, I feel, uh, I mean, these students were brought into the same room as, as I, and they were told to apologize to me in front of these administrators. And I feel like that connects exactly with um, the new policy they yeah. put in with the Confederate flag, right? T, yeah. can you talk about that? And yeah. what, is, what was this? Like, this was 15 years ago for me. At least yeah. 15 years ago, I was in this Fiona, and yeah. I feel like this really relates to. Yeah, well, Shen, as we've been asking them continuously to ban the Confederate flag, they told us that they put in a new policy. It's called Policy 4420, um, which is an anti harassment policy, and it, it prohi prohibits the harassment on basis of gender, sex, sexuality, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, but what they fail to mention is that in order for uh, a student to, or wait, let me, yeah. So they, they told us that that was their version of not letting the Confederate flag be in schools, right? But what they failed to mention is that in order for a kid uh, who's wearing the flag to get in trouble and get disciplined, I guess, it would take another student to report them through this policy. Um, and that's something that's just unacceptable because it's not the job of, a student of color and a student who's being harassed and targeted to put themselves in harm's way to report a student who's harassing them. Um, you know, Gilderland banned the Confederate flag. Niski is talking about banning the Confederate flag. I don't understand what's so hard uh, about banning the Confederate flag for Shen. Um, but uh, they just keep giving us these political answers and telling us that it's all taken care of. Um, I know you got to go, TJ. But I just wanted to say thanks for coming on. Keep up the good work. And uh, you. hopefully you guys will see some results soon. Thank you.
I'll see you guys. Hi, Drew. Um, well, Samira, thanks for joining me, Damaris. Do you want to talk briefly, Damaris, about the activism you're doing? I know that you work, create like safe spaces and you're a farmer and you create, uh, can you tell me more about it? I'm very intrigued. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm a, both a farmer and a community organizer. Different years I've been focusing on different work. Um, I like to say I mobilize plants and people. Um, and so right now I'm doing a lot of community organizing in Troy, um, very, I mean, similar to some of the work that TJ and Samira are working on, I mean, just on the scale of um, our, our city's policies and law enforcement's relationship to uh, uh, over policing in black neighborhoods and um, yeah, and, and trying to in increase uh, transparency and accountability in our criminal justice system and also really trying to invest in our black communities, trying to provide direct support what organization are you with? Um, is there um, a name? Yeah, I mobilize with Troy for Black Lives. Okay. Um, and then I as well, I also run um, another organization called Rested Root, where we work with um, many institutions, whether it's colleges, nonprofits, corporations, to both do racial and social justice education and also consulting. So we're trying to come in and be the folks instead of, instead of making the, the marginalized people do the work of changing the system, we're providing that service of helping to um, to work with organizations to help transform um, some of the ways that racism and different oppressions are showing up in their organizations. Um, Samira, do you want to talk briefly? I know you're an uh, activist in, in the community beyond, um, beyond Schenectady, mm -hmm. uh, Saratoga. Can you tell me about some of the work you're doing? Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, really just keeping up, up with the uh, um administration keeping up the pressure um it's hard because usually i got tj right by my side but now he's at school so um i'm doing it a lot by myself but also i got uh, my people from my speak out um i'm also working closely with uh el figaro and chandler hickenbottom who organized for uh the saratoga protests uh along with all of us um mainly focusing on obviously the death of Daryl Mount and getting answers for that. And then in Clifton Park, um, like I said, keeping pressure on admin, um, making sure that students are safe. Um, students know that I'm here uh, in Clifton Park. You know, they know I'm not going to school for a little bit. So um, I'm, always a I'm, always a, I'm always here to listen. I'm always a voice um, and I'm always here uh, for whatever they need, seriously. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I, if, I guess we'll sign off for now. Um, I think this is a really important issue. I, I appreciate you guys making time for this. Thank you so much for having us. This is very important to us. Thank you. Okay.